Fans of the Capcom Play System arcade machines have been able to enjoy some awesome at-home hardware enhancements over the years. Between custom super guns and multi-kits, people who prefer real hardware over emulation thought we had all we could ask for. Until OSSC creator Marcus released a product that many of us thought was impossible. A way to get true digital output directly from the arcade board. Let's take a look at the CPS HDMI kits. The CPS HDMI project works with all three Capcom Play System boards and work by tapping the digital video and audio signals right from the main motherboard. Installation is a bit tricky, both because of the points you're soldering to as well as how the wires are run. You'll need shielded coax cable for some of the lines, and it needs to be routed away from certain parts of the board. Also, bracing the HDMI port is a bit tricky, and no matter what, you'll probably end up with a sensitive connection. It's not that big of a deal, especially if you're already used to working with finicky arcade hardware, but just keep in mind that you'll want to secure the port as well as you can. To mount the HDMI port in a CPS2, you'll either need a custom case or you'll have to cut a bit of the original CPS2's turtle shell. While I normally hate cutting original plastic, it was a subtle change and, in my opinion, a really worthy trade-off. After installing, you could use the CPS boards in an arcade machine and use the HDMI out for streaming, or you could just use it like a standard game console. For consoleized use, you'll need to treat it pretty much the same that you would at any arcade board. Plug in a super gun, arcade PSU, and your arcade stick. If you have no desire to connect an analog monitor, you could even get an I.O. board that's essentially a super gun without the analog audio and video outputs. These are a bit cheaper and work pretty much the same way, just without any of the audio or video voltage concerns of a standard super gun. These kits have a bunch of cool features, so let's enter the menu and check them out. Entering the menu is slightly different based on which version of the CPS board you're using. CPS1 and CPS3 HDMI kits will require you to install two buttons directly to the kit. Depending on your setup, you could leave them wired and mount them in your cabinet, or you could integrate them right into your custom case. They only control the menu, so use whatever momentary push button switches and mounting you'd prefer. On the CPS2, the volume buttons act as your navigation. To enter the menu, hold the volume down button for a few seconds and the on-screen display will appear. Pressing volume down again will scroll through the options and hitting volume up will make your selections. Let's take a look at the menu options, starting with scan lines. First, there's an option for horizontal scan lines, which is the standard scan line option in most scalers. There's also an option for both horizontal and vertical scan lines, which might be interesting to try with some of the vertical shooters. You could then select if the scan lines are added by multiplication or subtraction, then select how dark they are, with settings ranging from 0 to 15. I don't like to spend too much time showing scan lines in these videos because they always look bad over YouTube, so just toggle this on your own monitor and choose what you like best. The next option is Quad Stereo. With this feature off, standard 2.0 stereo audio is sent. Toggling the Quad Stereo option might help with compatibility with surround sound receivers. On my surround sound system, setting it to 4.0 sent the game music to both the front and rear speakers. The 5.1 option did the same, but also mixed the channels into the center channel speaker for a really cool surround sound effect. I don't have a 7.1 setup to test with, but it should do the same thing as the 5.1 setting while also including the extra two rear speakers. I gotta pause for a moment and reflect on something. When I was testing the different audio channels, I had it set up through my home theater system and my OLED TV, and I ended up playing it for a few minutes and just thought, holy crap. Like, this is a crystal clear solution on a 65-inch TV, and with the surround sound system, I got bullets flying all around my head, all using original arcade hardware. I just think it's so unbelievably cool that we have the option to do that these days. Anyway, back to the options. Next, the TX mode can set the HDMI output signal to whatever matches your monitor. Most people will probably leave this on HDMI full, 
But if your TV isn't compatible with full range RGB color, you could set it to limited. There's also an option for component video color space over HDMI, as well as a DVI mode for monitors that aren't compatible with HDMI at all. Just note that DVI mode cuts off the audio as that wasn't part of the DVI standard. Then there's an option to save settings so the kit always boots with what you just selected, as well as a reset option if you'd like to set it back to defaults. All that's left is an option to check the current firmware revision, then an exit command to close the menu. I honestly didn't know how I'd feel about controlling a menu with just two buttons, but it was really intuitive and super easy to get used to. Okay, now I'd like to talk about all the different resolutions this kit supports, which to many people is going to be the coolest feature of the CPS HDMI kits. I'll start with 720p, which is the only resolution in the kit that's currently a bit off. I spoke to Marcus and he said even with the 3x scale, it's a bit tricky to get 720p right with the CPS kits, but he'd consider trying to fix it in a future firmware update. All the other resolutions available should be perfect for gaming, but if you need 720p for your capture setup, you could always adjust the horizontal aspect ratio in your software. Next is a 4x3 resolution of 1280 by 1024 This is perfect if you're going into a square LCD monitor, and it might also be a great option for streaming, depending on your capture setup. Then we have 1080p 4x, which allows for the full image on the screen, but with black bars on all sides. After that is my favorite mode when playing on flat panels, 1080p 5x. This zooms the image past the height of 1080p, but fills up a lot more of the screen while keeping the correct aspect ratio. It doesn't cut off so much that it affects gameplay, but there's an option that completely solves any overscan issue. If you're in 5x mode, you could set the Y offset to center the image. You might want to set this per game, as games like Street Fighter have a lot of unused space on the bottom, but other games might benefit from a more centered alignment. It's my opinion that 1080p 5x is one of the best options for most retro gaming experiences, and with the addition of the Y offset, Marcus really got it right with the CPS HDMI kit. Next, we have 1600 by 1200, which is a 4 by 3 aspect ratio that's essentially the same height as 1080p 5x, but sending the full signal without cropping 1080p borders. Depending on your monitor or capture setup, this might be a better choice. Then there's 1900 by 1200, which is similar to the previous, but a different aspect ratio. If your monitor supports higher than 1080p resolutions, try each of these to see what it's like and what looks best to your eyes. The highest resolution supported is 1920 by 1440, which is a 6x vertical integer scale. If you have a 1440p or 4K monitor, this might be the best choice, however you'll probably have to adjust your monitor's aspect ratio settings. The next resolutions are really awesome and intended for use with CRTs through lag-free HDMI converters. The first is a 240p resolution that actually outputs 1536 by 224. See, HDMI chips need to operate at a minimum frequency, so outputting standard 240p is challenging. But with CRTs, you don't really need to. All CRTs care about is the vertical resolution and refresh rate. Then they jam whatever horizontal resolution is sent into the same space. Adding this resolution means CRTs can accept it, and you could even add an HDMI splitter and adjust the resolution with your capture software. While some people would prefer just getting a super gun to play on CRTs, having this as an option is really awesome. Next, we have a 480p VGA resolution that applies the same super resolution trick with the HDMI chip. The resolution being outputted is actually 768 by 448 but if you connect the output to an HDMI to VGA converter, you could use it on a standard VGA monitor for a lag-free CRT experience in the proper aspect ratio. You can even add horizontal scan lines, then turn the brightness up for a true arcade monitor look on a cheap VGA CRT monitor. I actually have a different video dedicated to doing this with consoles as well, so please check that out for more info. 
So in case you couldn't tell by now, I am thrilled about all of the different resolution options, and I think Marcus provided us with everything the retro gaming world could possibly need, apart from the weird 720p quirk. In order to get all the features I showed in this video, you'll need to make sure that your CPS HDMI kit is on the latest firmware, and please note that previous versions of the firmware didn't have the on-screen display or all of the different resolution options. Updating is pretty easy though, and the same exact process as updating a time sleuth. I have a really detailed video on that, so please check it out for more info. I'll quickly run you through the process here though. First, you'll need to download the proper file for your board. The CPS 1, 2, and 3 each have their own specific firmware file for these kits, so make sure you download the correct one. Then, start disassembling the CPS boards. On the CPS2 that I'm showing here, you'll need to remove the B board, then take the top off the main A board. I have it unscrewed here just to make it easier to see, but it's still kind of tricky to get the plastic apart. Next, make sure the HDMI board is firmly in place, and connect a USB blaster programmer. Connect the programmer to your PC, then power on the arcade board. Just to be clear, the CPS HDMI kit needs to be powered for programming to work, so you'll either need to connect power manually, or just power it with a super gun like shown here. Now fire up your Cordis Prime software, select the file, and hit start. Once again, please check out the other video for details on how to download and set up both the software and programmer, as it's the exact same process with the Time Sleuth as it is with this CPS HDMI kit. After it's done, the green progress bar in the top right will show 100% successful, and the bottom message window will confirm that as well. Now just power off your super gun, reassemble the CPS kit, and you're all set. As a note, if you're using a CPS2, make sure the A and B boards are securely fastened to each other. It seems every time I swap B boards, it won't power up right away, and I'll need to reseed it a few times to get it right. That's honestly been my experience with pretty much every CPS2 kit I've ever used, including completely unmodified ones, so I figured I would just bring that up. So that pretty much sums it up. Marcus's CPS HDMI kits allow the CPS1, CPS2, and CPS3 arcade boards to output the best audio and video signals possible from original hardware. While yes, most people out there won't want to go through the trouble and cost that this requires, but there's still a lot of arcade fans out there that truly appreciate the real hardware experience. If you're one of those people and a fan of the CPS arcade platforms, this is absolutely a mod you should consider. With the upcoming CPS-1 Multi and the enhancements to the CPS-3 Multi, having an awesome at-home arcade experience is still a bit complicated, but it's never been better or easier than it is today. Thanks very much for watching. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing to any of my support services, such as Patreon or Floatplane, as your support is what keeps these videos, the weekly podcast, and all the behind-the-scenes research going. The weekly podcast is meant to keep everyone in the loop of what's going on in the retro gaming scene, and is available both as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.